Some people spend their whole lives wondering if they ever made a difference in the world. Brian Calvert doesn't have that problem. Brian is from central Indiana, and on on this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast, I am joined by Brian and his better-known and world-famous blue tick, Dixie the Praying Dog. After a series of tragedies in Brian's life, he developed a plan to make a positive impact on the world. His plan included getting a blue tick puppy to use as a multi-purpose hound. He had plans to track some deer and do some local therapy work for veterans and Riley Children's Hospital. But what happened next far exceeded those expectations, folks. Dixie has been involved in multiple honor flights, flying U.S. military veterans all over the U.S. She has recovered hundreds of deer for deer hunters. And then a few days later, she's walking down Hollywood Boulevard filming movies. She's been on billboards all across the country and around the world. She makes regular appearances at Children's Hospital where she drives a scaled model of her Jeep through the hospital. And this brings smiles and comfort to parents and their ailing children, making a huge impact and a lasting memory for those families. Dixie and Brian appeared on the Amazon Prime reality TV challenge called The Pack and quickly became a fan favorite. Brian and Dixie travel around the world competing with other teams and multiple challenges. Nope. Dixie is no ordinary dog, and Brian has found a higher calling for his blue tick companion. Listeners will get a behind-the-scenes look at what it is like to be involved in Hollywood production, what it is like to spend every minute of every day for 54 days straight with a hound. No breaks, just you and your dog. That's an interesting story right there on its own. How Dixie makes a positive impact for houndsmen for the non-hunting public and how Dixie is honoring American heroes with honor flights, military funerals, and service as a therapy dog. Stay tuned, folks. This one has it all. Joy, humor, and tears. Dixie the Praying Dog is on the Houndsman XP podcast. Test, test, tell them. Tell, test, tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'll travel around the country and stuff, and people will talk about Bob and Tom. And I was like, man, we were listening to Bob and Tom in Indiana before they went national, you know? Yeah, but I do. Uh, Dixie's the one of the grand marshals for the Miracle Ride, and Tom, Tom is the other like grand marshal for it. He hosts it. Oh no, the, kidding! That charity motorcycle ride for uh, Riley Children's Hospital. Yeah. But we'll yeah. lead that on Jeep, our, our real Jeep, and we'll have a Riley kid ride with us, and we'll lead all the motorcycles around the city. No kidding. Last how do you get the How do you get the Jeep charged up enough to roll around the city like that? Not that Jeep, our real Jeep. Your real Jeep. Okay, yeah. I got you. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of layers to this story, that's for sure, and I appreciate you. Well, welcome to the Houndsman XP podcast, Brian. And uh, <clears throat> you're just kind of the uh, the – you're you're kind of the behind the scenes guy the real star is sitting right there with you dixie the praying dog um and um dixie is a blue tick hound she's a good looking hound i'm looking at her right now and um how did you come about let's just start right at the, the beginning of how dixie the praying dog all came about it it, it actually started back in uh 2012 i uh, i live here in central indiana and I was a truck driver. I'm still a truck driver. At the time, I was driving the truck, and I, my neighbors called and said there was something wrong with my house. They smelled smoke, and they seen some burn marks on my house. And I told them, I said, hey, just go in and uh, bust the gate down and go in the back door and get my dogs out. Unfortunately, they couldn't They couldn't get in there because all the smoke, and all three of my dogs died in the fire. Um, one of them was a uh, German short-haired pointer. He was 14. We bird hunted off and on a little bit. Not as much as I would have liked, but... Uh, the other dog was a blue tick coonhound German shepherd mix. She was four. And then the other dog I had just rescued the previous Friday from running around the streets. We couldn't find his owner. And it was a hound of some type. Yeah. So, but unfortunately, all three of those dogs died in the fire. Very, very, very difficult time for me. I mean, it's like losing my kids is, 
you know, most of your listeners, all your listeners are hound guys and dog guys. So right. just imagine losing all, you know, all your dogs at one time and all your belongings at one time. And that's, that's what it was. Just, and I lived by myself. So it's very, very hard to deal with. Luckily I had a good support system with, you know, family and friends and all that. So we're finally getting through all that. Uh, that was 2012, uh, September of August of 2013. I get my house back. Finally starting to get things rolling again and getting back to normal. The thought of getting a dog is still nowhere in my mind. You know, I'm still devastated over losing those dogs from the fire. October rolls around 2013. I'm filming for an outdoor TV show. My buddy has a has his own TV show, uh, Eddie Brochen. And at lunchtime, I wanted to go cut a limb down out of one of my stands. And I went, it was the first corner of my property. I had to ride a four mm-hmm. halfway there to get back in there. Just wanted to cut this limb down, get out of there, come back, and uh, hunt in the evening. I go back there, not wearing a safety harness. I never wore one then. I just thought I was too good, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not going to happen to me, you know, you know, like most of us thought in those days. I climb up, sit flat on the platform, lean forward to cut a limb down, put my foot on a limb, and the limb I put my foot on was about as big around as my leg, and it snapped and broke, and I fell forward. And I fell, you know, my, that stand was about 18 feet. I fell 18 feet head first. And at the last second, I kind of tucked my shoulder and I landed on that limb when I hit the ground, Mm -hmm. knocked me out, didn't know where I was at. Like I said, I'm by myself. My cell phone's in my Jeep. And I finally came to, and I'm trying to process what had happened. And then I realized I can't see and I can't breathe. So then I knew something serious was wrong. And I was like, man, I just need to lay here for a few minutes and kind of figure this out. You know, and then go from there. But something told me if you lay here any longer, you're going to die. Yeah. I wow. Wheeled, well, I did it, but I wheeled myself to crawl to my four wheeler and pull myself on. I couldn't use the left side of my body, and I uh, rode that four wheeler out. Every bump I felt, I could feel the inside of my body burning, mm. like bones were shifting or something. I yeah. got out to the road, and I'm in the middle of nowhere, and the highway department just so happens to be coming by, cutting limbs down, getting ready so the combines can come down and, and take the corn out. And I flagged them down and they seen that I was in distress and they called the ambulance and uh, they took me to Indianapolis, the Methodist hospital. And once I got in there, they put a chest tube in me to drain all the blood out of my chest cavity. And then the doctor came in to see me and, and I kind of told him as much as I could, what had happened. Yeah. Because what you made the right decision. If you would have laid out there like you wanted to, you'd be dead. You were mm-hmm. suffering. So the best thing you could have done was got up and got out of there. But I ended up breaking my clavicle in like four different places, broke every rib on the right side of my body collapsed my lung Did you puncture a lung with a rib yeah I, that's I what caused the internal lung. bleeding yeah i destroyed a lung it went in that burning sensation i was feeling coming out of the woods was my rib that was they broke inward so they yeah. were still stuck in my in my <clears throat> lung and every time i moved it was ripping my lung apart so that oh, was man that was the majority of my pain was was uh, my chest and uh you know i bruised some vertebrae in my back and lacerated my liver and all that time, I mean, all that stuff is, is meaningless. They were just worried about, you know, my lung because that was potentially. Mm-hmm. And uh, spent two weeks in the hospital, six days in ICU with a, a chest tube. And while I was in the hospital, I had my sister take photos of me just so I could have down the road. And she didn't understand at the time why she wanted these photos when I looked like I was dead from the hospital. I said, <laughs> well, we're going to help people. That's, yeah, that's most people don't pose for photos at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it is, we're going to help people down the road, but she didn't see what I was seeing at that time. And, you know, two weeks in the hospital, that's a long time to process stuff. So just came through the house fire. Now I've got this, you know, near death experience. I'm like, man, I got to do something positive here. Let's, right. let's get through. And uh, I knew I wanted to get a dog again in the back of my mind. Just need to decide what type of dog and what I wanted to do. So in that hospital room, I decided at that time I wanted to get some type of a hound so I could track deer with it. But the main thing was to use it as a therapy dog to help help veterans and help disabled kids. That yeah. was my thought at the time. That was uh, 2013. Like I said, man, it, I just wasn't mentally there yet. So about 2015, I started getting the, the bug to get, get a dog. So I think I'm ready. And my dad passed away in 2015. And just, I just needed something. Man, talk about a string of bad luck right there, man. 2012 to 2015, that all happened. And 
right before I'd fall right before my house had burnt down, I lost my job that I'd had at we won't say which major delivery company, but I drove a semi for. Yeah. But uh due to an injury I had there, um, they terminated me and ended up having a long lawsuit with them and but all that kind of all there at the same time. And it was almost like somebody was knocking on my door telling me, Hey, you need to do something different, but be do something positive. And I came right. up with this opportunity. The, to get a dog. And I wanted a hound because when you do therapy work, your job as a therapy dog handler is to put a smile on people's faces. And all of us knowing how hounds are, I mean, the big ears, the sad looking face, that makes you smile. So that was a, me, the first dog I thought of. Then I just had to decide what type of hound I wanted. So I did a lot of research. I fell in love with blue tick because uh, one of my dogs that died in a fire, she had blue tick in her. Yeah. And I, I remember her demeanor how gentle and loving she was around kids and people, anybody she met, she was like that. And everybody told me, well, that's a lot of blue ticks and a lot of hounds are like that. So yeah, I called around and I, I found a lady that raised Gascon's blue ticks in West Virginia. She didn't have any puppies ready. And she led me to a guy in South Carolina called blue tick one kennel. Uh, yeah. he's no longer in business now. He, uh, he, un unfortunately passed away from cancer, I think three years ago now, but he had had his, uh, he had had his, uh, uh, bloodline going for like 40 some years. I mean, he'd been mm -hmm. doing it that long and, you know, a couple of different people told me that was the guy to talk to. So I called him up and he had just had a litter. It was just perfect timing. He sent me some pictures of this, of his puppies and told me to pick the one out that I wanted. So, cause I couldn't come and see him in person. Cause he's, uh, you know, 12 hour drive for me to where he was at 11 hour drive. Right. But I had a buddy who lived in North Carolina that was going to go down and pick the puppy up and deliver it to me. Uh -huh. I mean, my girlfriend lived together, well, ex girlfriend now, but at the time we lived together and uh, we've all got them. We've all yeah. got them, Brian. Well, I was going <laughs> to, you know, she knew that I was ready for a dog and uh, I was just going to surprise her with a puppy. So I set up everybody to come to the house on a Saturday. I was going to have a big party. My buddy went down to pick the dog up on a Friday before the party. And he called me and goes, Hey, we got a problem. I'm like, Oh, great. That's all I need to know the problem. What's, what's, what's the problem? He goes, well, the dog you had picked out that you've been showing everybody pictures of that you're going to get, he accidentally gave away. Ooh. I'm like, how can you actually give away a dog that was picked out of a lineup, you know, <laughs> nine weeks ago? He goes, I don't know what happened. He goes, what do you want me to do? I'm like, well, if he's got a female, I didn't want to see her. That's my dog. I wanted a female, get it and bring it. And let's go. So that's what mm -hmm. he did. And, it's uh he brought her home and he kept her that night at my little buddy's house and that saturday morning when i had everybody over the house i told him i had an announcement to make so they all thought oh you're gonna he's gonna propose to his girlfriend and this and that and the other instead i bring in this little puppy wrapped in his blanket and she popped her head out and that's that was the first time that we had met that we'd seen dixie in person and fell in love with her you know she was nine about eight weeks eight and a half weeks old and yeah all ears and feet. And that's, that's pretty much how it started. But you well, know, let's talk about, let's talk about that premonition, that dream, that vision that you had, um, uh, to, to what you wanted to do while you were laying in the hospital, how this thing started. I want, I want to dig into that. Yeah, man. I just wanted to, I, I was grateful that I was still alive and not paralyzed. That was right. the big, and I felt that God was sparing me. That's, I wasn't a, you know, a huge church goer and all that. And I'm really still not, but for what I do with her now, you know, I've had pastors tell me, Hey, what you're doing is she's a four legged minister for what yeah. we're doing. But at that time I knew that I had to, I wanted to do something positive. Just well, to the show way, gratitude for the my way life. I, uh, yeah. The way I found you, Brian was because a friend of mine posted a picture where you had gone to a, a wild game dinner that was being sponsored by a church. Yeah. And, and that's how, that's how I came across you. So you are doing, you are doing that kind of work with your dog. Yeah. We, I mean, we, we try to do everything that we can. I mean, we can't help everybody, but every weekend we're booked up, but you know, when the training process started, I had to work on a couple of different, you know, avenues here. I wanted the trainer to find antlers and to find deer. And I also mm -hmm. wanted to that, that hardcore, uh, obedience that she needed to become a therapy dog. And yeah. Eventually you know, she's pretty much my service dog too, from the PTSD and stuff that I have from that time of my life and that accident I went through. I, I didn't realize up until about a year ago, how much she was helping me 
as much as she helps other people, you know? So that's just another thing that happened that I've learned down the road, but going through this obedience stuff was, was the main thing. I didn't want a dog that I had to have on a leash all, all the time. I wanted a dog that I could have off a leash that would stay with me, listen to everything I said, you know, be <laughs> gentle with kids. I know it's a, I know it's a wish, right? But yeah. The only other dog you could have got Brian that, that would have been less suited for that would have been like a beagle. Yep. And that's nope. what everybody was telling me. Why did you get a blue tick to do all this stuff with? I'm like, well, I just fell in love with that breed and you know, they're how, how they are around people. And I didn't really think the whole process through as far as the type of hound to get, but I just fell in love with this dog and we just worked really, really hard when she was a puppy. So I mean, I was doing stuff every day with her. If we weren't doing obedient stuff, I was, I had her smelling antlers. I had her, you know, chasing deer hide around the backyard, tracking, deer, <laughs> tracking hooves, yeah. all that stuff that, you know, everybody does when they get a puppy that they're going to train to hunt, you know, you be coon hunters, rabbit hunters, whatever you're training your dog to do. I was doing that with deer stuff, but I was also training the obedience that right. a lot of the <clears throat> don't, they're not going to use their dog for that type of stuff. But I had, I had twofold. I was doing obe- hardcore obedience and I was doing the, the scent tracking and the scent training and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. So, so I, part of what we do on this show is, is try to talk about, you know, how much you can actually do with these hounds. You know, they're not, they're not just turn them loose and go get them type hounds. So I was hog hunting this last weekend. And, and one of the biggest things that we hear from the non hound hunting public from the other hunting hunters is that we can't, hounds are unruly. You can't train them. The people don't train them. And, and they're, you know, they're just wild that just run across the countryside. And this past weekend we were hog hunting in, in Louisiana and this is a top hound. And, uh, he actually swam a river, a swollen river following a hog. And he was, he was on the opposite bank from us. And this river at the time was like 150 yards wide, you know, from just the rain they've had in South Louisiana. And I've got video of Mike Colley recalling that hound and that that hound stopping what he was doing, getting in the river and swimming back to us, you know? So that's part of what drew me to you is, you know, you're not a hardcore houndsman coon hunter type thing, but you're out there doing things with this hound that are beyond the boundaries that we as houndsmen set up for ourselves a lot of times. You know, you, there's so much more we could be doing, and you've got such a special story, and that's that's why I you know wanted to have you come on and talk about that. So let's let's dive into you know some of the she's accomplished so much. How how old is Dixie? Dixie just turned seven in December. Okay, that makes me sad, man. Every year, you know, another year passes by, and I just feel like we still haven't done enough. You know, and once we get through my whole story and you learn what we have done, you're like, man, this you've done more than she's done more than most grown men will do in their entire lives and been more places. But I still feel if I'm not doing something with her on the weekend, I'm wasting time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was on the road doing something. Yeah. So let's just, let's talk about Dixie's career, what she's accomplished, you know, just hit the highlights of, of, and I know there's tons of stories behind each one, but uh, we've got a limited amount of time. We could do a, a whole eight hour podcast on, on just Dixie's career. Right. Well, like I said, she turned seven in December. So that means it kind of, it once hunting season rolled around, you know, of course the following year, she'd been ready. She was what, 11 months, 10 months, something like that. Almost mm-hmm. a year old for that first hunting season. So I didn't really want to track a whole lot then. I wanted to, wanted to track my deer and my buddy's deer. So I put the word out like anybody does when you're training a young pup. Hey, if you shoot a deer, let me know. Even if it's a good shot, I want to bring Dix out and put her on the track. Mm-hmm. So, that's what we started doing, but back up to, uh, to about September, she, I took her to get her, well, it was over that summer of, uh, 2016. Yeah. So I guess it would have been after we did the, the deer track and stuff. So as far as her therapy dog work goes, my neighbors were volunteers for Indy Honor Flight and Indy Honor Flight flies World War II, Korean and Vietnam veterans to DC and back in the same mm-hmm. day. It's pretty much a national organization. It's just when you get further west in the country, it turns into about a three-day event where ours is the same day. We go to D.C. and back in the same day. Right. So we're like, when you get Dixie ready, we like her 
you know, I know we knew that they want, they knew that they want that I wanted her to be a therapy dog. Mm -hmm. So when she gets ready, uh, bring her to honor flight to our welcome home. And maybe she could be the therapy dog for honor flight. I took her to that first honor flight and I had trained her to pray next to people. So when we got there with the veterans, she could pray next to him. We could take a photo op with him. And then I would salute her and she'll bark out. Thank you veterans. Because I didn't want her not to bark because everybody wants to hear a hound, see a hound. They want to hear it bark. So I wanted right. to incorporate as part of what we're doing where she could bark on command. So that's what we do. I have her pray next to a veteran. I say, Dixie pray, take the picture. I say, amen. Then I salute her and say, thank you veterans. She barks it out. So that started in, you know, that first year that I had her when she turned one and I thought she was ready for her therapy dog work. And, you know, it just, it just exploded after that. All these mm -hmm. veterans were asking us, Hey, can you bring her to this? Can you bring her to that? And we would just we go anywhere we could and do whatever we could for everybody. And we're, you know, we're starting to words getting out about who she is from that. And then they realize she also tracks deer. So now all these veterans that hunt, <laughs> I know a dog that tracks deer. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. So, and that kind of was her, her celebrity status going to therapy dog outlet has helped me, you know, branch out in the tracking world too, because everybody knows who she is. And they know that we track deer. Right. So they'll call us. And if we can't get to it, you know, I'm a member of United Blood Trackers. That's kind of how I cut my teeth is I learned a lot through those guys. I got a couple of mentors there. A lot of your listeners probably know Al Sherman. He's got a Catahoula. He's from Southern Indiana. He He's one of the best trackers in the country as far as mm -hmm. body And then you got Ron Sliffer from Illinois. He raises a bloodhound to the two guys. I have my back pocket that I can, you know, throw questions at and issues at. And yeah, especially Al, Al's retired and he'll go, he'll drive wherever all over the state just to track deer all over the country pretty much. So if I couldn't get to the track, I would call Al because usually I'm so busy with her on the weekends, you right. know, really, it really the, the, the more popular she got, it was harder for me to, to even hunt let alone go out and track for somebody else. But we still managed to average, you know, her first two years, we probably did 15 to 20 tracks those first couple of seasons. And then uh, in 2020, 2019, we got asked to audition for that Amazon Prime TV series. Called The just, Pack. Called The Pack. And they, uh, they, were, they went through like a thousand dogs for that. And they narrowed it down to 24. And we didn't really know what was going on. I just seen an email, I just seen a post on social media for one of our local news stations. Hey, if you got a cool dog that likes it, likes to do adventure and you want to try it for a, a TV show for a major TV network, send us an email. So I emailed the leg and said, Hey, I got a pretty cool dog. Go check out her social media. And that was another thing that people thought I was crazy for. I started Dixie's Facebook page and they're like, why do you want to start a Facebook page for your dog? I said, well, it's going to help with the tracking stuff. And it's going to give me a place to show pictures from her therapy dog stuff. Right. So I just told the lady, I have a, Hey, I have a cool dog. Go check out her social media. She so you, up, you approached the pack and you, you kind of put in a, a resume application. Type kind of, thing. Yeah. yeah. I just told her, I said, Hey, I've got a pretty cool, cool dog. Go check out her social media. That lady emailed me back. She was a, she was a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, publisher. Like a, yeah from hollywood mm -hmm. and i emailed this i got a pretty cool dog go check out her social media she emailed me right back she was can i call you like right now <laughs> she was like going crazy she's like i can't believe you have a hound dog and you're you know you're doing all this cool stuff with veterans and she does all this cool scent work tracking deer and all that and they kind of like the i mean it's hollywood they kind of like somebody different you know i was yeah at the time, I didn't really realize it, but they wanted me. I was going to be the so-called hillbilly of the show, you know, the the country guy with the with the country dog and all that. So, right. you know, they they flew us out there. They flew me out there twice before they even met Dixie in person. The the first time I flew out there, I met with all the execs from Amazon because that's you know it was they're the ones putting the money in it. So I just went through and do it. I I did what I'm doing with you. I just told them my story. You know, I was, yeah, I, nothing the the makeup. I've got a story. I told it to them. The house fire, you know, uh, falling out of the tree stand. All that, yeah. You know, told them all that. And they just, they fell in love with the story. And then the, they were already in love with Dixie just by seeing her on social media. And then we finally got, I finally got to take her out there. And that was Dixie's first time to fly. And this would, this would have been in December of 2019. 
So they, they fly me and Dixie out there and everything's top secret. We get to the hotel room. They're on little microphones with other security people. Hey, Brian and Dixie's here. And they sneak us up to our hotel room. To be, they don't want to see any other dogs. Yeah. What this was going to be, and I didn't know at the time, it was a two-week doggy boot camp, which is going to be the final audition. And there was 24 of us there with our dogs, and they were only going to keep 12 of us. So we went through this whole process of doing scent work, uh, zip lining together, rappelling off buildings together, uh, can, uh, kayaking and swimming and all this crazy, just off the wall stuff. But one of the most important things that we were doing was you're filming a TV show. Your dog can't be afraid of other people or a cameraman or other dogs. And right. Dixie therapy dog work and being with honor flight with all the media attention it gets. She's used to all that. Right. Uh, she's used to cameras being on her and thousands of people being around her and a ton of kids trying to pet her. So they put us in this room and the people, the production company was uh, the same production company that does uh, the amazing race, Naked mm -hmm. and Afraid. And, and uh, most of the cameramen came from Survivor too. It was that. So you had to take you had to take your clothes off and stand there yeah. naked with. Yeah, this. that's what I was. I, that's the first. Thing I'm I naked asked. and I'm afraid. They didn't really tell me the concept of the show. I'm like, you know, I'm I'm a little crazy, but I hope it's naked and afraid with your dog. So no, it's nothing, nothing like that. So they put us in this room. It's Renegade Productions. It's the production company. So they put us in this room and. All these camera guys just come piling in like, all right, have your dog pose and do different stuff. So I said, all right, Dixie, pray. So Dixie dropped down in a prayer and they're walking yeah. around cameras. They got cameras in and out of her face. They got boom mics over her, all the stuff. And she doesn't move until I tell her to, until I release her. So like, yeah. yeah, she's good with that. You know, she's good with the cameras and you just keep going through this process. And every other day, another dog would, you'd come back into the, so they'd split us in two different groups, 12 and 12. The first five, the first 10 minutes I was in a room, the girl next to me freaked out and just couldn't take the pressure and gra grabbed her dog and left and never came back. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, that quick, people people were leaving. Because when they split you up, you would have to do stuff. Because they were sending us training stuff at home before that, like a month before that. And every Sunday, we'd have a Zoom meet, we'd have a Zoom call with the two dog trainers they hired. One was uh, Nick Benninger from the United Kingdom, and the other one was Nicole Ellis. She's a real famous Hollywood dog trainer. So they were teaching us to do this stuff that we were going to do. We didn't know we were going to have to do that, but they would send us stuff in the mail, like those big tubes the dogs have to run through and yeah. stuff. And Dixie already knew how to fetch, and they had to wear the, the Rex Specs goggles and vest and the booties. We already did all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That wasn't an issue, you know? Yeah. And the only thing that I thought we would have trouble with was, you know, we're hound guys. We're, our dogs are trained to track an animal. Dixie's right. trained to track. Well, they were going to use birch oil for the challenges that we were going to do. So we had, I had to totally teach Dixie a new smell to, to find, and that was birch oil. So they sent me this little metal box that had holes in it, and it slid mm -hmm. open like a little pill box. And a, a jar with Q-tips that had the birch oil in it. Mm -hmm. And you would take one of those Q-tips, put in that box, put it in her food bowl, and put the food on top of it for two weeks. Yeah. Just keep smelling that. that yep. bird. Then eventually start hiding it in the house. And it's just, a, it's this is Hollywood's way of training scent work. It's, well, you know, it's also solid scent work training. We've done podcasts with with people like Ariel uh, Peldunas, and Heath Hyatt runs a show every week. That, and we've had some of the top scent work guys in the world on that podcast, on the yeah. journey. And, uh, yeah, it's a uh, scent association. You put the scent there, they get a good reward out of it. And boom, you know, you move it, you put it under the bowl, you put it buried in the feed, you do all that stuff. And, and they get that, they get that subliminal message that this smell is good. And it builds that desire to find it. Hey, have you checked out our website? Houndsmanxp.com. We've got a lot of cool stuff over there. There's links over to our Patreon. All of our bonus material is there on Patreon. You get a link right to that. You can also check out all of our awesome sponsors there. And a lot of those links have built-in discount codes. So when you click on that link, it takes you to the website of our sponsor, and it's got a built-in discount code. You can find companies like Cajun Lights, Dogs Are Treed. You can even go there and support Freedom Hunters. All right from our website. We're also getting ready to launch 
our online store. We're going to change that up a little bit, and uh, we're going to have some cool stuff in there. We're going to have belt knife sheaths, custom made. We're going to have um, some cool tumblers there, our hats, T-shirt designs. All that's going to be on our online store at houndsmanxp.com. Check it out. We were in these big hotel hotel ballrooms split up in two groups, and this is your first time you get to see the other dogs. This this one dude walked in. He's a... Uh, He's a, he's a good friend of mine now. He, at the time, I'm thinking, I'm coming there with the attitude like this is, I'm going on Survivor. I don't want to be friends with these people. Right. I don't want nothing to do with them. I want to show them what I can do with my dog. I want to get in their head. You were competitive about it. I'm competitive. I want to yeah. intimidate them. You know, a lot of these dogs <laughs> wouldn't wear the goggles. They wouldn't wear vests. They wouldn't wear the booties. First day I walk in, Dixie's got her goggles on, her vest on, and her booties on. And I come parading her in there in my camo vest with my sleeves cut off. You know, with, <laughs> so the sleeves cut off. Looks like Larry the Cable Guy. Then I get to see these other people coming in. Uh, Gay black dog groomer from Hollywood. His name is Josh. Josh White. One of the best dog groomers in the world. He does all the movie stars' dogs. At the time, we didn't know any of this. We couldn't talk to anybody. I had to wear a name tag with Dixie's name on it. So everybody had to call me Dixie. I was called Dixie for two weeks. Because (laughs) what it was, they don't want any of us talking and getting to know each other off camera until they got it narrowed down to who was going to make it. So he come walk in, he's got a standard poodle that is rainbow colors. I'm like, what in the world is going on here? What? This is, this is, this is, there's no way in heck this kid's making it. No way. So yeah. he come, then a mom comes in a stay at home mom and she's got a, a Labrador. Then another girl comes in with a golden retriever and it's jumping all over the place, not listening. And a guy comes in with a Husky and you know how Huskies are. Yeah. You know, they're, they're hard, hard to deal with a lot. And it was bouncing all over the walls. Then this other guy comes in, he's got a blue Mohawk and he's got a, a golden doodle or a labadoodle, whatever. One of those doodles. Yeah. It's got a blue Mohawk and it's wearing little bitty sunglasses. I'm like, man, me and Dixie's got this wrapped up. Yeah. This no brainer. We we're going to, we're definitely going to make this show for sure. So I just came in all cocky like that, thinking all that. And then <laughs> as it went, I seen these people and I seen their dogs and it was cool as a dog lover to see all these dogs that's never done the the scent work and that type of stuff. These dogs just figure it out Mm -hmm. as as the week, as the two weeks, you know, you keep getting close to the end of the two weeks. I'm like, man, these dogs are doing everything that we can do. I mean, yeah, we're a little better at the scent work because as you guys know, it's, it's more, it's just as much the handler as the dog more. So it's on me because I got to learn to read her. And that's what mm-hmm. a lot of those folks didn't figure out in that two weeks, their dog was starting to figure out the scent work, you know, but they couldn't figure out how to read their dog. Right. So I kind of figured that out, but just to see those folks and their dogs of all different types of dogs, big dogs, little dogs, figure stuff out. And then you're like, Oh man, this is, this isn't going to be a walk in the park. Like we thought it was, you know, this when I was really- a canine handler, the hardest part for me, and it really helped me in the long run with hounds too, with my hunting is to admit that I was the weak link in the team, you know, and the do- we're asking those dogs to do a job that we can't do. And then putting your trust in that dog and, and just taking that big dose of humility, uh, you know, that a big bite of that humble pie and, and saying, I'm the dumbest one here. This dog's got it. You know, this dog's got it figured out. That's the hardest thing for, uh, I, I believe the hardest thing for a dog handler that's using it for scent work to learn is to trust your dog. Always yeah. trust your dog. Once you figure that out, you're going to be a lot better off. And that's, yeah. that's this kind of the process that they put us through or put those other folks through that had never done scent work in their lives. You know, they kind of put them through the same thing. Hey, you, can, you guys need to trust your dog and figure out how to read them. You know, and that's what those right. trainers taught them. But it was a whole different training process from what I'm used to. I'm used to using, you know, when she was a puppy, I was using the pinch collars and the choke chains and the e-collars and all that. It wasn't going to be none of that here. There was none of that allowed. It was all right. positive training retreats. When I heard it was positive training retreats, I'm like, my heart sunk. I'm like, man, we don't work with treats. Yeah. She is so food motivated. She loses her mind on treats. So that was an that was my biggest issue with this whole process was all these folks running around dropping treats on the floor everywhere. And I'm trying to get my dog to perform <laughs> on the treats in a minute. Like when we're out in the grass and these parks practicing and stuff, she's finding all these treats everywhere and it's, you know, holding us up. 
because she wants right. to eat. So that was yeah. our biggest biggest issue. Plus, I e collar, you know, trained her, and I still use an e collar on her to this day for different different situations. And it wasn't none of that allowed because we we're going to go into Europe. E collars are, are not made, allowed. Not yeah. even allowed. Yeah, you even know? garment like the tracking equipment use we use on hounds are developed and marketed completely different in Europe than they are in the United States. There's no e collar. There's no you know it, you can't use any of it. Yeah, and it was just. That whole process, I had to kind of flip how I was training her. Yeah. And our biggest problem was tugging. And there's going to be a lot of tugging in this competition where they had to open doors and stuff like that. And Dixie wasn't a tugger. So I had the flashback to what I learned from, you know, I learned a lot from Jeremy Moore, the owner of Dogbone, on how to do the the uh, antler retrievals and the hold uh -huh. you know, in, their, in your mouth and all that. So I had to flash back. They wouldn't let us have our phones or anything. They confiscated our phones from from day one. So no we kidding. Had no access to the internet or anything. So I'm trying to flash back to remember what I learned from Jeremy. And I also had John Jehennehy's book with me, you know, that everybody calls the Bible of blood tracking. So luckily I had that with me. I could go back and read that. But also the big thing was remembering what Jeremy had taught me about hold, you know, when she's holding the antlers in her mouth. And that helped me, you know, go through the tugging process and teach her to hold stuff in her mouth and to tug. I had two weeks to do that. We might not make the show. Right. By the end of two weeks, I have to remember what it, what I you know learned from Jeremy. I had her holding and tugging and everything we needed to do to make the show. And we came home right before Christmas, and then the Monday after Christmas, I got a phone call from the casting agency and said, "Hey, we'd love to have you and Dixie on the show if you if you if you want to go." I'm like, "Absolutely." What do I? I was actually in my semi. I'd pull over. I about had a heart attack. I'm like, "Are you kidding?" Because <laughs> like I said, I came in all cocky, thinking there's no way. And then by the time I left, I was totally unsure because all these other dogs were doing just as good as, as she was, you know what I mean? So yeah. when he said that I pulled over, I'm like, well, yeah, what, when we leave and what we got to do, he's like, well, we're not sure yet. Typical Hollywood stuff. We're not sure yet. We'll, uh, we'll call you in a couple of weeks and let you know. The first week of January, I got a call and says, Hey, uh, can you be ready to go in two weeks in uh two days? I'm like two days. They're like, yeah, I'm like, no what kidding. Cause well, you need to tell your boss, you, you need to be gone for three to four months. You need to commit to us for four months. I'm like, so basically I'm going to have to quit my job. And they're like, well, that's between you and your boss. If you want to go, that's that's a stipulation. So I went and mm -hmm. talked to my boss, and he's like, look, man, that's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You know, $500,000 was the first prize. Opportunity to travel the world with my dog. Yeah. So he, let's, like, talk, let's talk Let's talk about that a little bit. Do it, and he let me do it. He let me come back, and we went and did our thing. Yeah, let's let's talk about that TV show and, and being on the set and how much exposure – uh, you brought to, you know, a hound breed, which I think is awesome, but, uh, let's spend a few minutes talking about that regiment two days notice, boom. And then where you, where you run off to at that point, uh, Brian, they, uh, they flew us to, uh, Los Angeles, picked me up at the airport, took me to universal studios, Hollywood, you know, where the theme park is and where they film a bunch of movies at. put us in a hotel. I'm up in the hotel room for. A minute. I just set my suitcases down. There was a knock on the door. And this is when it got real. I opened the door and there was a great big giant Polish guy with his shaved head and fatigues and a military guy. Yeah. And I need to see your stuff. I'm like, my stuff? He's like, I need to see your stuff. And he kind of barged his way in the door. <laughs> my suitcase. And I had a suitcase for Dixie. I had all her gear in there. Yeah. So he went through all my suitcases. Then he asked to see my phone. So I showed him my phone. He took it, put it in a bag. He wrote my name on it, left. I didn't see my phone for another three days. No kidding. Did they with dump your these, phone? Yeah, with all these shows like that, especially a competition reality show like this, they don't want you to have access to your phone. And in most cases, they take the they take the TV out of your room also. But for mm -hmm. us, they didn't take our TV from us because they knew we'd be in there a lot. Right. At least they let us have our TV. Like some of these other shows, they take the TV out of your hotel rooms wherever you go. So took my phone and it was gone. And the next day we had a, uh, had a meeting with the security detail and what they were going to, you know, what they expected from us and what we could and couldn't do. And we really couldn't do anything. If we weren't filming, you were locked in your room. That was it. Don't talk wow. to nobody. And, you know, going back to her being a therapy dog, you're, you're in Russell studios. There's hundreds of kids around. I get on an elevator to go to one of the filming things and all these kids pile in and they all want to pet Dixie. She's got her goggles on. She's got her boots right. on. She's go. 
and these kids want to pet her. And this guy literally put his hands out and pushed these kids away and said, no pets. And they were, the parents were trying to take pictures of her and they said, no pictures. And that broke my heart. I'm like, man, this is what we do. But yeah. that's, that's how it was going to be. You know, these guys meant business. Their job was to protect our dogs, mainly our dog, not even us, more so the dog. <laughs> Nobody was allowed to touch them. Nobody was allowed to take pictures of them. And it's funny, those guys, you know, they're all ex-military. One was from Poland. One was from uh, New Zealand. One was from, I believe, Argentina. And the guy that started was a retired colonel from America. It was his company. And all they do is security for Hollywood movies and TV series like that that's going to travel out of the country. That's yeah. what they do. And after about two weeks, these guys got so soft and attached to the dogs. They loosened <laughs> up. They're hugging on the dogs. And the Polish guy was like, hey, I just want to tell you, Dixie's my favorite out of all you guys. He, he was, you know, being a military guy, they appreciated sure. how we how we were. You know, I'm not I'm not military, but everything we do is for veterans. That's Dixie's job is to take care of veterans. So every I made it a, a thing before I left. I was going to wear the same camo vest, and I was going to wear an American flag patch on my vest, and she was going to have one on her vest in every country we went to. Yeah, no questions asked. They told me they advised me against it showing the American flag in different places, but I'm like, I don't care. That's my tribute to vet. That is secure. I get what they're saying out security purposes, but I don't care. That's, that's who we are. We're Americans. We're here. You know, we're going to represent veterans. I'm going to wear a flag in every country we go to. And we did. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's true blue. I mean, you won't find a more patriotic group of people than, than houndsmen, you know, and, uh, I've seen it time and time again. And to hear you say that, is pretty cool. So tell us what to tell us what to sh give us an overview of the show. You know, just what you guys were trying to accomplish and and what that looked like. Well, the whole concept of the show is like the Amazing Race that's been on TV. I mean, they've got like thirty some seasons now. So you, what the concept for our show was? There's twelve dogs and twelve humans. So mm -hmm. we're at Universal Studios, and the first episode, we're in this courtyard, and I'll explain to you where this courtyard is. Everybody's going to know this courtyard I'm in, where we're filming at. These helicopters fly over and they drop these dog tug toys. They're in these tubes. So they started all of us in a line, all 12 of us. And they said, when they said go, we had to run to this courtyard, find one of these tubes, grab one end. Dogs had to pick up the other and you had to tug it apart. That's where the tugging come in to be very important. Huh. When you tug it apart, a bunch of confetti flies out of it. And there's a bandana. There's two bandanas in there. And whatever color bandana that is, green or blue, they split you in two different packs. Hence the name of the show, The Pack. Okay. We didn't know that until that moment, what was going to happen. So once you get that bandana, you got to run to a location where your other five pack members are at. And then from there, there's a sign. And you have to choose from a different, just got two different words on there, what you had to do. Mm -hmm. And that, that was going to decide where you had, what your challenge was going to be next. So we ended up, before we got to that point, once we got our bandanas, we all had to run to this court, to the back of this courthouse. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, why does this look familiar? But we're in the process of filming this. So we run to the back of this, this building and it's a fake, it's a fake town, you know? Yeah. So we get to the back of this building. They run us up. We get on these, uh, vests and Dixie gets on a vest and we have to put on hard hats. We're going to zip line out of something. So we're on top of these buildings now yeah. and we zip line. It's the freaking clock tower from Back to the Future, where they filmed the movie Back to the Future. Oh, no kidding. That courtyard. And we're in that clock tower. I'm in that clock. And I zip line out of that with Dixie attached to my hip into a military vehicle, which is fitting for us, for our pack. Right. So once all of our member, all pack members get there, we take off this big six-wheeled camo uh, vehicle from Universal Studios, and we drive to uh, Long Beach. The other pack... They go into a limo. They're going to the Queen Mary, which is one of the most famous cruise ships that's still around in the world, to do their challenge. Yeah. But when we get to our challenge, it's at the USS Iowa. And this is kind of explain to you how the whole show is going to work. We get to the USS Iowa. All six of us and our dogs have to run into the, the Navy ship, put on Navy outfits, and we're doing a scent challenge. That's what we pick. Because if you, you flash back to that two weeks that I had that doggy training where I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. There was another guy there had this big handlebar mustache and he had a, a, uh, uh, blue lacy. I'm like, man, that, okay. that's, a, 
I said, that, that's a, that's a tracking dog. I said, we got a little competition for scent work here. Well, back in that two weeks training, we weren't allowed to talk to each other. The productions assistants, everybody had a production assistant assigned to them that would make sure you didn't talk to anybody. So when we took, I took Dixie out to, to, for a bathroom break and he took his dog out at the same time for a bathroom break. Our PA's got sidetracked. So he came over to me and goes, Hey, is that Dixie? I'm like, how do you know who the, how, who we are? Right. He's like, I'm not United blood trackers. I'm like, are you kidding me? That was wild. I said, do yeah. not tell because if they realize we're both in United blood trackers and some kind of club and we have some kind of relationship, even though we don't personally know each other yet, they'll send one of us home. So we kept that quiet and I never found out. So here <laughs> we are, members of, of United blood trackers were on this amazing show, getting ready to do these crazy things around the world. But he ended up being on my pack. So that's why yeah. we chose the challenge back at the courtyard where they filmed Back to the Future. So our scent challenge was on the USS Iowa. We had to put on these Navy outfits. And the dogs had to find big puzzle pieces that were hidden throughout this whole ship that had yeah. that uh, had that scent on it. The uh, virtual. Uh, virtual on it. So here we go. We're searching the ship and we find our puzzle pieces pretty quick. And we build this puzzle to get our clue to get us out of there to where the Queen Mary is docked to where the other team is at. And then from there, we have to take a speedboat across to meet up with them. And we're racing them to the, find the finish line on this little peninsula at that, at that marina. And whoever comes in first, they're safe. They don't have to do an elimination challenge. Whoever comes in last, their pack has to do an elimination challenge the following day. And whoever yeah. loses in that elimination challenge on that pack, they go home. And that's the concept of the show. So we right. lost that challenge. So we had to do the first elimination challenge. And we had to find our way from our hotel. We're sitting in our hotel room with a, with a camera crew in there. Every dog in person had a camera crew assigned to them. So I'm in my hotel room. You know, we had to get dressed. And we just have to sit there. And you just have to wait. You're waiting for a knock on the door. And there's going to be some kind of a clue. And you're going to figure it out. Yeah. It, on elimination day, like it's panic mode. You don't know what's going to happen, especially on the first one. We didn't know what to expect. So we get a knock on the door and you got a story person with you too, that kind of helps you walk, walk through and what the, the interview you and what to say on camera. And I'm sitting there. He's like, you need to go answer that door. I'm like, okay. So I go and open the door. There's a newspaper. Then he's like, pick it up, read it. There's a clue in there. So I picked this newspaper up and I'm going through it. The only thing I seen there was an advertisement for a park called Rosie's dog park in uh long beach and we were at that time we were in in long beach because that's where the ship was at so i guess i'm running down to the lobby to get on a taxi cab <laughs> so i grab dixie and take off running and i get a taxi cab and i tell the guy i'm like take me to rosie's rosie's dog beach and you just got to hope he takes you to the right place and i was the third person out of my the third or fourth person out of my room out of the six so once we get down there I've got a, a the guy driving my cab. He's he's African, and uh, he's talking to me when you know we're trying to figure out where to go. And I'm like, "So where where are you from? You're not from Kentucky, are you? Just trying to get a just right. trying to lighten it up a little bit and be funny." And I go, "You're obviously not from Kentucky. That's not a Kentucky accent, right?" And have you ever heard of the Indianapolis 500? And he goes, "Oh yeah." I said, "Well, drive like you're in it and pass that cab." And he sped up, and we passed a couple cabs of the people that was in front of us. And we got to the beach where we were supposed to be. And I look around and you, you start to figure out, you look for camera crews and tents and that kind of stuff. Cause that's how you know you're in the right area. Yeah. He dropped me off at the wrong spot. I ended up having to run and lose some time. I had to run all the way down the beach about a mile and backtrack back to where I needed to be to start the challenge. But once I got going, she kicked in and we had to dig up a, a box with a key in it. Then we had to do something that got me to the front where hounds aren't supposed to do. And that was sit and stay in place. And then I had, oh, no run, kidding. I had to run away from her. And then when I got to the next checkpoint, I could turn around and call her to me. Then I had to have her sit again and then run again and then have her sit and then call her back to me. I had to do that with her and she nailed it. We got right to the front. I had to spell out a word after I opened his chest up. I had to get these life preservers out that had letters on them. And I had to figure out what that word was and then hang them up in a certain way. And then running the finish line. And yeah. then whoever came in last in my pack was going home. Well, I was first. And I, when I put my letters up, I put them in the wrong spot. And the other guy caught up with me. And uh, they're like, no, no, those, those are in the wrong spot. So I don't know how anybody else is. But with me, 
when I'm exerting a lot of energy like that, it's hard to think on my feet that quick. And that's that's what you got to do in this. You're exerting a lot of energy. Yeah. Plus, you got to be quick on your feet. You got you to gotta be thinking and this and that and the other. So once I finally figured I'd put him wrong and I got him set right, I went and I was second across the finish line and we we made it. And then from there, we went to, you know, went to Mexico and did stuff like that there. How many different countries you go to, Brian? So we went from uh, America to Mexico to Costa Rica to New York for a lay down. We had, and that's another thing, the logistics of all this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's had to get dewormed three different times for the different countries we were in because yeah. each one requires something different and then getting their food and all that. That's a whole nother aspect. That was one lady's job was the logistics of all that. And our vets, of course, our vets flew with us and our trainers flew with us. We had two yeah. vets and two flew with us everywhere. But so we went from Mexico to Costa Rica to New York for a lay down, stopped in Ireland to fuel the plane up. We had our own airplane, let the dogs pee on the air on the uh, tarmac, got back in the airplane, went to Austria, Switzerland, France, Italy, um, and I'm forgetting somewhere. But all over the place. You, you I mean, travel I, you travel around the world with your dog doing challenges they, they just like country. that. You know, I was gone about 55, 56 days as far as that mm -hmm. part of the trip is concerned. And it was it was like being in a rock band. You know, everybody wants to be a rock star until you actually travel like that. Yeah. I got a lot of respect for, for that because <laughs> I mean and we, and we were staying two to three days in every country and then we'd leave. You know, right. I couldn't imagine doing that 300 days a year you know, in a different city every, every day. I don't know how they do it, but yeah, yeah, it was, it was something, man. I got to see, see stuff. I never thought in a million years I would see, but not only did I get to see it, I got to do it with my, see it with my dog. Yeah. Yeah. Friend, and do all this stuff. And it's a hound, you know, right. We'll see what, what we did on that show and what me and Dixie did and what Dixie did. I mean, it's her, it's all her. I mean, typically hounds aren't supposed to do the kind of stuff we were doing and, we were doing it. We were flying in airplanes, helicopters, rappelling out of building, off of buildings and zip lining and whitewater rafting in the jungles in Costa Rica and staying cool. in five star hotels all over the world. It was just, it's just crazy, man. And just, and I have video footage that proof that we did it, you know, you yeah. watch it, yeah. you know, so just a wild experience. So how did you do in the competition? I think everybody's probably wonder, wondering that and uh, not to, so, I, it sounds like people ought to go and watch the show to get people the full need to story. Go watch it. it's, it's super cool. Yeah. I don't want to give a whole lot away, but we did really good. There's 10 episodes. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll be in seven of them is all I can tell you. Yeah. And I think everybody be proud of us. We did. Yeah. Pretty good. We, well, I think that's a good. Your dog is a, on, and you learn this and this, this goes true with all of us and everything we do every day, especially with filming that TV show. You're only as good as your dog is only as good as you. Mm -hmm. You know, your dog can't run. Your dog can only run as fast as you can run because we had to run a lot. Costa Rica, I ran seven miles. I lost 12 pounds in the first three episodes. There was that much running. And I was the oldest person on the show. At the time, yeah. I, was, I was 47 when we filmed the show, 48. And everybody else was in their 30s or younger. Except yeah. for one mom. She had, she had turned 40 while we were filming. Mm -hmm. So but as far as that goes, I wish I would have watched The Amazing Race before that. I might have went and ran and <laughs> This some stuff. But one thing that helped me, other than the scent work, of course, was when we had to run a lot, the dogs always had to be on a leash. Some of these folks aren't used to running with their dogs on a leash, you know, getting pulled and all that. Right. I took my 25 foot tracking lead with me. I was using that a lot. And these people are looking like, what are you? Then they figured it out. Hey, that's like running with the dog off a leash. Yeah. We got to like Costa Rica and had to do stuff in the, in the rainforest down there. We had to run up and down all these hills, just like being in Indiana tracking deer. You know, everybody right. else falling down and rolling down these hills and I'm upright the whole way. Cause I've done it before. This is just like tracking a deer for us. So mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that we do here paid off for that show, you know, it helped me, but yeah. you know, you're going up against a border collie and I won't say any more than that. Those are the smartest dogs in the world. And all I will say is the right dog definitely won the show. Yeah, I'm sure. Definitely the right breed of dog did because you, those are just the smartest dogs in the world. You know, so yeah. Well, you just I'm, said I'm, more I'm, than I'm, that. It was kind of my fault how we got we got eliminated in Switzerland due to a bad cab ride. It was kind of my fault by not double checking he was going the right way. You know, I was yeah. If I if I would have well, don't done, don't let the don't let the cat out of the bag. 
I want, yeah, I I want, want, yeah, I want, I want to go see it just I for me. I kind of screwed up in Switzerland, but we'll yeah. leave it at that. But it's, yeah. it's a phenomenal show. It's very, and one thing that we were worried about was, you know, a lot of these reality shows, it shows a lot of bickering and fighting, and this doesn't. And, and as dog lovers, everybody's listening, you'll appreciate this. It shows more the the bonding aspect of the human and dog relationship. It focuses on that. And yeah. then us as people from different walks of life coming together, you know, like that, I go back to the, to the dog groomer with the poodle. He's a gay black dog groomer from California. Yeah. You know, with, with our past have crossed and we'd hung out any other time like that. If I would have met him, I'm, I'm that type of person. I like everybody until you do something to me that I don't like. And then that's it. Right. Well, him and I are still friends. That's an side. Indiana thing. Yeah. I just seen him in November, you know, and he was terrified of me the first couple of weeks because you're the hillbilly. He thought, well, here's this racist, you know, hillbilly from Indiana. Right. No way he's going to like me. And yeah, I treat him like I did everybody else. And he, uh, well, he actually, he I actually think he crying one day and was like, Hey, uh, I want to apologize to you for, you know, discriminating against you, what everybody does to me. And I did it to you without even knowing you. And he goes, yeah. I learned, we all learn lessons filming the show, you know, about ourselves and with our dogs. So it was really pretty cool how it turned you out. Said, you said a lot of stuff there that's got a lot of value to it. You know, everything from, from the bond and, and, um, uh, man, I should have pumped the brakes on you a little bit there, but, um, you know, there's a saying among houndsmen that, that a man's ego is a heavy burden for a hound to bear. And we get, we get tribalistic in the way we think and the things we do and, and different stuff like that. But, but you talked about the human experience and the, the bond and, and different things, which I think is a good segue in to the therapy side that you do so much of. And it's a, it's a good opportunity for us to kind of shift gears and move into that and talk about you know, why you do what you do, but I want to talk, I want to say something before you, I turn you loose. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is very valuable in this whole thing is, is the exposure that uh, the hound has gotten through your work. Um, your ability to, to, cause you track deer, not only you're a hunter in a very liberal place with a dog that's very misunderstood and you're out there representing a breed of hounds and a lifestyle that's, that's virtually unknown and, and a lot of people are ignorant to it. So, so that's, that's another reason why I wanted to have you on here. So let's talk about your therapy work and talk about, uh, you know, what that actually entails and, and how you're doing that. I, I love your story about the American flag and, so let's dive into that therapy work because I think that is something that is an honorable, honorable thing for you to be doing, Brian. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, that's why we started. I wanted to help. I wanted an outlet to ha to help veterans and help sick kids out. There's nothing worse to me than seeing a kid that's sick in a wheelchair or something's wrong with them. I just it's just not fair. They sh kids shouldn't be like that. I'd rather have that burden on myself than on a kid. So I wanted a way to help them. I'm you know I'm not a rich guy. I'm, make enough money to have a house and all this and that, but I don't have a bunch of money to donate, but right. I thought, you know, I can get a dog. I can train it to do stuff to help people. And that was the whole plan from the get go, you know, whether it be helping a kid, helping a veteran. Well, you donated, it, you donated the most valuable thing, Brian. You can't buy time. Yeah. You know, time time is the most, yeah. The time is the most valuable thing that we have and none of us get to control how much time we have. We can go out and work hard and make money. And I think a lot of times, um, you know, people kind of, they take the easy way out and, and throw, throw money at a problem instead of investing their time. So I think it's honorable. I thought, I never thought in a million years I would ever miss, you know, deer season, especially the rut or just, just the, uh, you know, everything that surrounds opening day, a shotgun season, like it does here right. in Indiana. You know, even if you're tagged out, you still go out with your buddies or you That's go right. or you go hang out at the check-in station and all that. The once Dixie started getting popular, you know, that that first year or two was was okay. I was trying to feel my way through some stuff. I was tracking deer with her, doing some therapy work, but it really hit me when I was asked by Indy Honor Flight that uh in 2019, 2018, I guess, to volunteer for the Veterans Day parade. 
Veterans Day is November 10th every year. That, you're talking prime time of the rut. Right. That first year that they had that, that, that I was asked to participate in that was opening day of shotgun season, and I hadn't killed a buck yet. So <laughs> that's when my life changed. Yeah. Uh, I realized then, yeah, hunting's important. That's my passion. But it's more important for me to take this dog and help these veterans out and show them some respect. So that first year that I ever missed opening day shotgun season with a buck tag in my pocket, that's when my, that's when my eyes opened and said, Hey, mm. you're here for a reason. This is your purpose, you know, continue to do it. So, and that, that started everything right there. I mean, yeah, it started when I got her, but that's when it really hit home. The first time I ever missed opening day shotgun season. And that, as hunters, we all know how big of a deal that is. And for me to give that up, you know, I had people calling me, my buddies are like, I can't believe you're not hunting today. I'm like, well, this is just a little bit more important. You know, I got plenty of time to hunt, you know, even though I'm missing, you know, the big day. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why I got her, man. You know, like yeah. it goes, that tree stand accident. I'm here. Somebody kept me here for a reason. This is my reason. I just, it just took me a while to figure it out. So yeah, purpose to be here and it's to use this dog to help people. How is she received by the public when, when you take her to, I know you do some stuff with Riley Children's Hospital and, and uh, different things like that. How she received by not only the kids. I mean, obviously, kids gonna love the dogs and and things like that. But but I'm really looking for the impact that you have with the family as a whole. Well, you know, you, you talk about Riley. The first year that we helped Riley out was about the same time as around 2018 for that for the miracle ride. At that time, the, you know, the motorcycles would drive around the city and they drive by Riley Hospital. And all these kids come out, mm. the kids that are able to come out of the hospital will come down and wave at the motorcycle riders as they come by. And then the motorcycle guys get to drive around the motor speedway and they come back to a big party. Well, I went to the hospital with Dixie and we parked the Jeep and we went up and stood with the kids. I wanted the kids to meet Dixie. I didn't want to, you know, be involved with the motorcycle ride per se. I wanted to meet the kids. Right. So this boy comes out and they're pulling their kid in a wagon. This little boy has no hair. He has a, uh, uh, an IV and he has a nurse walking with him and it's the, the little boy, his mom, his dad, and his sister. So I go up to him. I'm like, Hey, does he like dogs? I'm like, Oh, he loves dogs. So I let Dixie go up and do her thing. And he's, she's kissing on him and he's petting her and he's real weak. So mm. Dixie sits down. We sit by this kid. That's all. It takes about 45 minutes for all the motorcycles to come by. This little kid had his arm propped up to wave at every bike that went by. And, uh, so I'm talking to the dad and I'm like, Hey, I don't mean to intrude, but what's going on with your son? He's like, well, he's got cancer. I'm like, what's his prognosis? He's like, it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It's, it's coming. It's just, when is it coming? He's going to die. That's yeah. what he told me. Well, man, I hate to hear that. I just, I just, and I told him about Dixie and what we do and he appreciated it. And so fast forward to last year, I'm at the fairgrounds for the deer and Turkey expo. This man and woman comes up to me. And, uh, sorry, this is the, it's all right, man. This shows the real passion of what you're doing. I'm getting a little bit emotional with you here. The impact we can make as humans on our world is, is, uh, we don't take advantage of it enough. And the reason I wanted to talk to you about this, Brian, was so that so that people could see why they need to stop at the campgrounds when they're out hunting, uh, to let people look at their dogs and not, not drive by and wonder why people are out here camping during the middle of bear season or, or bugging them or, or whatever the impact that we can have by, by familiarizing people to who we are and what we do. Right. So, you know, we're at the deer and Turkey expo last year and that miracle ride, you know, I'm very good friends with the president. Now Dixie and I will lead that ride in our Jeep. You know, we'll have a Riley kid ride with us. We'll lead these motorcycles all over the city now. She's like the grand marshal. Right. So I go and sit in the booth. I bring Dixie to the booth to help them get people and to raise money at this deer and turkey expo last year. Uh -huh. This made the woman come up to me and they got a little girl with them. And they're like, you remember us? I'm like, man, I, I meet so many people, you know, um, you look familiar. Well, we yeah. met you at the, at the miracle ride. We were the family. Uh, 
man, this is tough. <laughs> they said, uh, <laughs> big rednecks aren't supposed to cry like this, but this it's pretty, pretty emotional because that was the family that I'd met at that miracle ride. Yeah. Boy was sick and their boy passed away three days after that ride. Yeah. And they remember, uh, Dixie and they seen that she was going to be making an appearance there. So they wanted to make a, a point to come and see her because they'd watch her on the TV show and they wanted to come up and just say what it meant for them to meet and their boy to meet her that day. So right. that kind of brings things full circle that shows me that, you know, we're doing the right stuff. Well, I, you know, you are doing the right stuff. And, and again, it's just, it's one of those things you made an impact forever. Those people, when they see a hound, they will think of Dixie and the, the investments you made in their life. And it changed their perception of, of what that breed of dog is for. So when they start seeing, and we do a lot of this kind of stuff and I'll just tie it in real quick and we'll move on. But when they see people that are mischaracterized, you know, the anti hunting crowds and, and things like that to say, oh, all houndsmen are, you know, they don't, they don't care about their dogs. They don't, you, you made impact. You're making thousands of, of impressions on people that can step up and say, no, that's not what it is. You know, these dogs aren't bloodthirsty. They're not just looking for my, my kids have petted these dogs and built relationships with them. And I think that's such a valuable thing, Brian. And that just shows, you know, and I keep bringing this up a lot when people ask me about Dixie, I just say she's versatile because we can go and do stuff like that. And then we can turn around and go, track a deer and she can be a dog. She can play fetch. She can yeah. find, it, find an antler. She can be ferocious on a track where you don't want to get around her because she's going to rip a deer apart. And then she can go and do stuff like that where she's kissing on some kid or kissing on a veteran. Or, you know, last week we did two different funerals for veterans where she sat at the casket for the whole showing after wow. people would see, her, see the veteran, they would pet her. And then we lead the casket. It'll lead the hearse and our Jeep with the police lights on it to the grave site. And then she sits at the grave site for family. We do that once a month, almost twice a month. Sometimes, you know, wow. we did it twice last week. That's just something I didn't foresee happening. I just wanted to do stuff with veterans and kids. And now it's turned to us, you know, going to funerals and Dixie's presence is asked to be at funerals. I had a funeral home ask me if they could put her on a, as an amenity that people could purchase to have her come and be at anybody's funeral. And I said, yeah, let's talk about that. You know, so that's just the kind of the impact that she's had. And it just, blows people's mind that it's a hound doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, like you said, a lot of hunters, you know, they, they hunt for dog and that's, that's it. But then there's uh, the other side of us. We hunt them and they're our family too, you know? So yeah, a big part of it for me, I, I wouldn't want a dog that wasn't going to be a part of my family. Yeah. That's how I, how I do it. I mean, this is my kid, you know, he goes everywhere with me. We do everything together. I mean, when you, when you travel the world like that, we we're together <laughs> hours a day. You know, for like 58 days straight, we were to, to, we weren't separated. You know, when you do something like that all over the world, I mean, that's just, it's just the bond that you get. And hunters know about that bond because they spend yeah. so much time training their dogs and in the field with their dogs, whether it be tracking deer, raccoons or bear or bird hunting and, and all that. The training that you put in, that's what blows my mind. A lot of these hunting forms, I, I see guys asking for, hey, does anybody got a dog that's trained for sale? Why would you? I get that if you don't have the time to do it, but man, you're so much better off getting a puppy and training it yourself. That way you can develop that bond. Not everybody has that skill set though. Not everybody's got the skill set to do that. And, and I think a lot of times, a lot of these puppies, uh, end up in places. Some people would just be better off buying a trained dog if they're not right. going to be totally immersed in it. And, um, yeah, some people would just be better off buying a trained dog, but, um, uh, I'll, it's getting back, get, point. you know, even if you're hunting with your dog, you got, we spend so much time with these dogs. Yeah. And that's bonding right there. I'm too. telling you what, man, though, you talked about houndsmen and, and us spent, I'm going to tell you right now, 58 days straight, I'd be looking for some place to get away from the dog for a little bit. <laughs> and, and you also got to remember too, we, we weren't allowed our cell phones Yeah, and the further away from America you got, the less TV you had. I right. had to watch the Super Bowl in 2020 for Mexico City, you know, on Spanish TV, which wasn't too bad. <laughs> but once you got to like Costa Rica, there was hardly any TV down there. Right. You know, once you get 
especially like in Switzerland, you're, you're on the top of a mountain, you know, there's yeah. the only thing I had on my TV to watch there, they had a live feed from the top of one of the ski slopes and they played that polka type of music, which is the Switzerland type of music. And the sound of music. That's all I had to watch. So, <laughs> I was like, and you know, the, when the, they would come and bring my food to the door, like, what are you watching? What are you listening to? I'm like, the only thing I can on this right. TV. So, right. Yeah. You just, you just, and we trained a lot, you know, I was hiding that little pill box with that birch oil. I was hiding that sucker in the, in the ceilings in these hotels just to make it, it, it and she just figured it out. Yeah. So we were constantly training is what we were doing. Every hotel room, we would do scent work in it and I was hiding stuff all over the place. And I <laughs> hide it. I, it got to the point where I was locking her in the bathroom. So she couldn't see where I was, what I was doing. I'd go in the big part of the hotel room and hide that thing. And then I would bring her out and tell her to find it. And she would find it that quick. I mean, that was just, you had to, you had to do stuff. I figured if I'm going to be locked in this room and I'm filming a TV show as a competition show, I'm going to brush up on my skills nonstop unless I'm right. sleeping and I did the whole time. What did you learn? What did you learn that you didn't know about Dixie in those 58 days? You know, as far as, uh, I mean, you got a, you didn't have anything else to do. So you're just sitting here working with Dixie and, and, learning stuff about her scenting ability. Did you learn anything that was, uh, you know, groundbreaking for you during that time? Yeah. I mean, I figured, I figured uh, I learned more scent stuff and how to read her better just by being that time. I thought I knew how to read her. Yeah. You know, when, you, when you spend that much time with your dog doing that type of stuff, especially locked up in a hotel room, you know, you learn that type of stuff. I even took, you know, one of those rubber dummy antlers with me yeah. that that dog bone has. And I called it urban shed hunting. I was hiding the shed around the hotel room and stuff <laughs> like that. Just, you know, it's just the same thing as shed hunting. And now I'll do that at these expos we go to just to show a little demonstration. I'll hide an antler in there down an aisle somewhere and have her go get it and bring it back just to kind of show people. But she's over there ripping the taxidermy mounts off the, the wall. And every one to- she walks by, and she goes up to every one of them. I'm, I'm like, Listen, it's already been found. Good girl. <laughs> already been found and people get a kick out of it so oh, that's it, great man spending that much time with her and uh it just i don't know like i said man this is I, i've had those other dogs and they were my kids too but i didn't spend the time with them that i did that i have with her so it, it's just it just brought us like you know like oh i can't even like imagine father, daughter and we argued a lot and back and forth <laughs> I heard that a lot from the other contestants. They they would get a kick out of it. The big thing was I was, you know, she might be, she would bark a lot. She doesn't bark, you know, like your typical hound nonstop constantly. Right. And cracking a deer because she's fired up. She knows what we got to do now filming the show. She, she, it goes to her therapy dog work too. She can sense that I had high anxiety and there was like a competition part of it. So she was fired up like she was on a deer track. Yeah. So if you watch the show, she's howling the whole time. And what's funny about the show is, and Amazon in particular and the production company, they ran with that. Yeah, they used that as part of the as part of the show and a part of who she is. And and I I've heard from people literally, literally all over the world about how much they love this hound and her how and and all that. And they said when we left, the show got quiet and boring. I heard that from <laughs> a lot. And even in one episode, she helped one of the contestants find us because she was howling. They had to find the finish line and Dixie was howling. So this guy totally went around his last <laughs> tra- trick that he had to do and came right to us because he heard Dixie and he found the finish line that way because of her. But but when you watch the show, you're gonna you're gonna know there's a hound there for sure. Yeah. And that's I've heard it from people all over the world. She she stole their heart. So yeah, that's enough for me. You know what I mean? So well, Brian, let's talk about how. I mean, this stuff isn't cheap. It's not free. Uh, You've got a remote control Jeep that she uses at, uh, you know, at different venues. When you go do events, you're doing Hunter Ed appearances and talking about your experience and also talking about Dixie. So you're getting the word out there to other hunters. And I think the biggest um, perceived threat to houndsmen uh, in the hunting community is a deer hunter, but in Indiana, if you go to a hunter ed class, people are there to get their li- get their cards so that they can buy a hunting license and they're probably going to hunt deer. And here you come showing up with Dixie and, and 
you know, changing that perception or at least planting a seed there so that the, so that you can build some bridges there. But how can people support Dixie the Praying Dog? Because I think that's important that we cover that part. I'm in the process of starting a not-for-profit, and I'm going to call that the Praying Dog Foundation. That's a long process. Mm-hmm. So if people want people want to help us out, you know, um, I've got Venmo and PayPal and all that. But the best thing to do is just go to her social media sites. It's Dixie the Praying Dog. She has Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. And let me tell you, that's a whole nother full-time job. Oh, yeah. But it's also, you know, it's good publicity for hounds. I mean, it just shows what they can do. But it, go back to something you had said earlier, too, about walking this line that I walk with the so-called, you know, anti-hunters and, you know, the, the Hollywood people mm-hmm. that don't believe in our lifestyle. I walk that fine line. So I try not to show a lot of dead animals on her pages. People know that she tracks deer, but just to be fair to everybody, you know, I don't show that type of stuff. I don't show dead animals on there, but people know. Now I might put that she tracked a deer. If you want to see a picture of it, it's in the comments or something like that. But that's one of the hardest things for me to do is walk in this, this fine line where I'm tiptoeing, you know, Hey, there's, you know, anti hunters over here. Hey, here's my hunting crowd over here. And I hear it from both sides. I hear the hunting side of it. Hey, why don't you promote this more this way? And then I hear it from the others. Hey, I don't want to see a dead deer here or or hear about it or this and that and the other. So I've got, I've got to tread lightly in what I do. And I've got to remember that this dog is here to put smiles on people's faces. I don't care if you agree with my lifestyle of hunting and the outdoors or you don't. Right. I want somebody to, to like this dog and I want her to make you smile. And it's, it's a shame that everybody don't think like that. And we don't want to get into politics. I have my beliefs of who, who I want to vote for and who I don't. And I don't even show that on there. It's all her right. social, it's her showing her with the kids, the veterans and driving a little Jeep around and doing all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. and people know we track if they need us, they can call us. Yeah. So it's a very, very fine line for me to walk. Yeah. So people can go to your social media platforms, Dixie, the praying dog, find everything that they find your contact information. And if they want to donate, um, to help you with your, your expenses, they can, they just send you a message through they Facebook can just message me and we can figure out their best way to do it. If they want to do it on Venmo or PayPal or, um, they can, she's got her own, uh, checking account at a yeah. PNC. Banks. So they could probably even call PNC and do it like that too. You know, I just, it's just Dixie, the praying dog. Um, like I said, I've had so many people, I didn't get into this to people help me out. I got right. into other people. So, yeah. Um, and I, I don't, nobody should take it that way. You know, I, I, what yeah. you're doing, what you're doing is, is above and beyond. I mean, just the story you told, I can, I can, I know your heart's in this thing, Brian, you know, when you're telling the story about the little boy and his family and stuff. So I don't think anybody should be confused. This isn't a money grab. It's not, it's not one of those nonprofits that that's just out there to, to grab your money so you can drive fancy cars and, and run around. You're out there doing actual good work. And that's why you're here. If I thought it was anything else, you wouldn't be yeah. here. Yeah. My, the, my big expenses is the upkeep of my Jeep. Like, uh, they've recently that there was a Jeep builder that wants to rebuild it. So they've had a couple of fundraisers to try to do that, to help, uh, you know, put a new motor in it. Cause it's an 07 and it's getting up there in years, but it's part of what we do. Yeah. It's got Dixie's picture on it. It's a tribute to veterans. We do a lot of parades, a lot of funeral escorts, and then she's got those mini Jeeps and then our travel expenses and our, yeah. you know, starting that stuff. So that, that adds up, especially now with not working in eight weeks because of my back, that's a, it's a whole nother issue I'm dealing with right now. And I'm trying to, if it wasn't for this dog, man, I'd be, a, I'd be a mess right now. Yeah. So yeah. I've got a lot going on, but I don't tell the general public, but I still show up at our events and do what we're supposed to do and, right. And, and keep her going the best that I can. So it's, yeah. it's hard for me to take stuff from people when I'm not in it for that. I'm in it to help people. So that's something I've had to learn in the last year is to let people help you when they want to help you. So that was just a tough part of it for me. My my grandmother used to tell me when somebody's trying to help you, just accept it. Because if you don't, you're stealing their blessing, you know? Yeah. So they, it's every, something i got to work on for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm the same way. It's like... Uh, you know, if you help me, I've, I, there's times when I feel obligated to, to go and help you back, you know, and sometimes you just need to say thanks and, and move on. But yeah, Brian, I appreciate it, man. We're going, I want to, 
I'd like to come and see, uh, what Dixie's all about. And, um, I don't think this is the last time we're going to hear from you on this Man, podcast. I could, we could talk so much. I could give you one whole episode about, you know, just the, the stuff that happened filming the TV series. Uh, we didn't even get into the movie she's in. We got back from filming the Amazon show. She got cast to be in a, a movie called the Mayberry man. Now they're going to do a sequel to it. We were in, and this goes back to the versatility. November 8th, we tracked our last deer of the year for a, a friend of mine that's a conservation officer here in Indiana. Their number two buck, the guy put a, thought he had a good shot on it. Long story short, we tracked that deer all day. It was liver shot. We jumped at midday, backed out, came back in at the end of the day with no blood, tracked it to a scrape. It was bleeding in scrapes. And Dixie, we were about ready to give up, and Dixie didn't want to give up. We went down the one more creek bottom to check it. She found one more scrape, and that buck was dead. 10 yards from that last scrape. Wow. That was November 8th. November 11th, I'm walking down Hollywood Boulevard filming a, the sequel to the Mayberry Man movie. Wow. So that just shows you, again, just how versatile these hounds can be if, you know, it's just all about what you want them to do. And, you know, all that time I spent with Dixie, that's what I learned about her. You know, you get told so much, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's total, total garbage. Dogs yeah. can learn anything at any time. And that's one of the biggest things that I learned from that show was you can teach dogs to do anything and you can teach people to do anything. Yeah. You just, you know, figure out how that, to do it. That's an interesting message because we talk about a lot. You know, we, we, we look at, everyone wants to know, yeah, I see this question a lot among hun houndsmen. It's like, what age do you consider a dog to be a finished hound? Meaning, you know, it can track and catch the game, you know, it, when do you consider that dog to be a finished hound? And my, my response is when they're dead, you know, yeah. that's, that's when they're a finished hound. They can continue to develop different skills and, and excel and, and learn new stuff. So let's wrap this thing up. I want to, I want to see the, uh, the salute. Oh, you want to see her pray real quick and yeah, let's see her pray and, and then do the salute. All right. Thanks. Did she pray? Dixie Pride. Nope. Up. Uh, uh. Dixie Pride. Right. Look at that. Amen. Say thank you. <laughs> Say thank you, Beth. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> and that's it. And then, you know, she drives that little Jeep around and it's just, I don't know, I just think of this different stuff. And I've learned so much from other, watching other dogs. And that's that's another aspect hunters can take. You know, watch watch videos of other dogs doing stuff and trainers doing stuff and you know, you and I kind of talked about that. Yeah. I've taken, I've learned from two or three different trainers that, that are, you know, highly respectable trainers, you know, Jeremy Moore and John Jehennehy from UBT and Darren Petty and yeah. Indian working dogs and all those guys. I kind of took everything I learned from them and kind of turned it into my own thing. So don't, don't be afraid to go out there and, and learn from these guys, but still make it your own. You right. know, that way you're more comfortable with, you know, you have certain words you use. I have certain words that I use. Yep. Just take everything you learn from different people. Don't be afraid to to look in different different places. You know, I've learned a lot from the Hollywood people too. And I've learned so much from that hunting guy. So don't be afraid to mix all that stuff up and turn it into your own. Well, great story, Brian. I really appreciate your time. I I appreciate you and what the work you and Dixie are out there doing and how you're representing. You know, I I know some of the backstory on movies that are highly respected in the, in the hound community, like where the red fern grows and things like that. And, um, uh, as houndsmen, we can't just look at this thing and think, well, she's not doing real hound work. You know, she's doing now when the red fern grows where the red fern grows isn't real hound work either, but it was an impactful movie. And you ask, you ask houndsmen what their favorite movie is. And they're going to say where the red fern grows almost every time. Yeah. And, and, um, you and Dixie are, are, giving us a 21st century version of that, of, of making that impact on a broad spectrum worldwide of, of what's able to be done. What, what our hounds are capable of doing and the impact and the, the message that they can carry for us. Good job, man. Yeah, for sure. I mean, any, I, I hope we got more stuff to do. We got another, she's got a, two movies coming out this, this summer. Hopefully they come out this summer. One's a horror movie and, One's kind of like a Hallmark kind of movie. The horror movie, I had to incorporate some hunting stuff to it too. She had to go and find a 
a severed arm in the woods. So I had to, I had to uh, buy a, rubber, a yeah. fake rubber arm and, and put deer scent on it. And I laid a track <laughs> and I set the cameraman up and it's like, how do you know she's going to run here? I said, she's going to run here. She nailed her taking the first shot. We had her yeah. film in 30 minutes and they were blown away. And that's wow. taking the hunting aspect of things to, to Hollywood, you know, right. And doing it, how like, it goes back to how I trained her to do stuff meshing everybody else's stuff together i made it into my own and that's what everybody out there could be doing right now great all right folks well that's gonna do it i want to encourage everybody to take check out dixie the praying dog on all the social media platforms and uh, share this podcast share it with with your friends and and family members that that uh want to hear a great message and a guy that's doing great things with a with an awesome dog so Brian, I appreciate your time, and thanks for being on the Houndsman XP podcast. This is Fair Chase. <laughs>